Hey everyone, this is Tony. I'm the Dungeon Master for D&D Raw. Thank you for joining us. Hi, my name is Adam and I play Akiva in Serviceable Plus. Hey, my name is Rachel and I play Elaine in Rumble Squad. Hey, my name is Chris and I play Auric in Rumble Squad. Hey, this is Nick. I play Leuven in Rumble Squad. All right, and before we begin this mailbag episode, I just wanted to say to everybody that we will be having spoilers for Serviceable Plots up to episode 50 and Rumble Squad from episodes 31 to 35, which is the completion of Arc 1 for both of these groups. And we'd like to give a thank you and a shout out to all of our patrons. Thank you, William McCracken, Ryan Ray Vermette, Limbo, Jeremy D. Kleinons, Mike C., Nick D., Shazuro Ajo, Mosiru, Naked and Afraid, Grimfuse, Feral Joe, a Linux fan, Death by Mage, Larry Haydorn, and our producer tier patron. Thank you for serving as a producer on our episodes, Johnny Torres. Just wanted to tell all of you, please continue to be safe out there. Uh, wash your hands. Don't touch your face, including your eyes, ears, nose, mouth. Uh, wear a mask if you go outside. We're all trying to be safe here. Uh, and we hope that you are all doing well as well. Don't lick your friends. But Tony, what if I want to pick my nose and then wipe my face? Wash your hands. At least 20 seconds with soap and warm water. I do want to announce by the point of recording this, um, we are at 112,000 downloads. Oh, uh, yeah. I will admit I wasn't sure we would ever get to this point <laughs> when we first started this. I was like, guys... We have 10 downloads. That's awesome. We have 12 and it's not all just us. Didn't we like freak out when we got 100? We were like, man, we are just on top of the world at this point. People are listening or at least downloading. Plus, I can guarantee you at least 50,000 of those aren't me. <laughs> <laughs> Though it needs to know. <laughs> but anyways, just uh, in general, wanted to say thank you all for listening to us. Like, we really appreciate the support. We really appreciate the viewership. Um, and at any point, please feel free to message us, email us. We'll post a link to our Discord as well um, and all our contact information in the description. We have several other announcements to make before we actually jump into the mailbag. First of which, I wanted to mention that we did do a Dark Matter stream at the end of July. And we have our edited version as part of our podcast feed. Um, so that is available everywhere. Uh, it is a lot of fun. I really like D&D in space. Actually, what did you guys think of the whole Dark Matter experience? Because you all played. It's a different like beast in and of itself, but it's, it's a nice change of pace sometimes. And there's a lot of unique stuff that I found really cool. It was definitely interesting to add in the space mechanic. And then there was kind of on top of that, kind of like a space cowboy type theming as well, or at least for the mission that we did. I like the amount of love that they put into the material, um, just kind of showing that, yeah, uh, fantasy and sci-fi can coexist, and uh, b building something around that was a, was a lot of fun, even just for a one-shot. I liked ripping worms off the side of the ship. With three of your forearms. <laughs> Uh, next announcement is a uh, Gen Con panel. Uh, for anybody who didn't get to attend uh, Gen Con this year, obviously, because it was switched to virtual and then everything was kind of in a weird state, um, we actually got to do a panel with Chaotic Anarchy from Thread Raiders. And the panel was about playable podcasts engaging the audience. We answered a bunch of questions about running actual play and doing podcasting in general. Um, if you're interested, you can view the recording on our YouTube channel. We will provide a link. And it was really awesome. We had a great turnout. Lots of questions. We actually didn't even get to all the questions. So it was it was really, really good uh, as far as everything went. We will also be editing it for release on our feed during September. So stay tuned for that if you want to just hear the audio version. If you want to see our beautiful faces as well as Chaotic Anarchies, definitely check out the YouTube page and uh, give it a check out. We don't just answer the questions that deal with podcasting and, you know, a campaign. We also answer the important questions like pineapple on pizza. Pineapple on pizza. Yay or nay. Worst. It was voted for science. It was an important poll. It was. But if you want to know the results of that poll, go check it out. Next on our announcements, for International Podcast Month, Bethany GM'd an RPG one-shot 
uh, that will be coming out in September. And you can listen to the full adventure of Scum and Villainy on the IPM feed on September 15th. And then we'll be posting it on our own feed during the month of October. So I have the the script here of what it was like, but Neon Citizen has had run-ins with Assistant Police and Hegemotic News Network, HNN, paints an image of them as rabble-rousing troublemakers with no future. Neon Citizen wants to break into the HNN field office orbiting the planet and broadcast their own message to the people, spreading their punk ideology. But they need a way in. Can our ragtag band of scoundrels work together to make bank and spread their name across the sector? Or will they push their luck too far and end up on the wrong side of powerful enemies? So yeah, honestly, like Scum and Villainy is an awesome system and it is really fun. You guys definitely need to check it out when it comes out in September. I certainly will. Well, you guys have done Scum and Villainy, right? Yeah, we played it for my birthday. It's a cool system. It's very uh, narrative focused. Both the uh, Game Master and the players work together to create the story. Also, the Game Master never has to roll a dice. That's always nice. They already have so much to keep track of anyways. Attention all humans, elves, dwarves, gnomes, and all humanoid creatures then between. We will be releasing a re-edited version of the Oranthal Saga. We've been meticulously combing through the audio and done a bit of tidying up for some improved quality and clarity. Be on the lookout for that later this year. We are bringing up our Oranthal episodes up to closer to our current editing style. Um, Adam has been working on them diligently for the past couple months. So thank you so much for that, Adam. Keep on the lookout. Finally, that's the end of our announcements, but we do ha- want to let you know how to get in contact with us if you do have questions, feedback, or just want to say hi. You can find DD Raw on all of your favorite podcatchers. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Rules is Written. You can also email me directly at dm at dndraw.com. You can also join our Discord. Like I said, we'll post a link in the description. And please, if you have the opportunity, if you can, support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash dndraw. And now on to the questions. First, I want to give thanks to uh, those who have submitted questions, uh, have sent me emails. So first, thank you, uh, Mitchell from Galaxy's Greatest, a Starfinder podcast. Check them out. I've listened to them. It's uh, quite the adventure they go on. Also, thank you to Sean and to Oliver for your questions. I'm happy I was able to help out. And uh, thank you for listening. We always appreciate it. So the first question uh, during the setup before you guys go into the abyss in serviceable plots. During the encounter with the Whispered Ones while in Orenthal, there was an episode where Belinda and Nyssa fought with Sadan and captured Kendral. Um, you were asked what how I built the guns in my world. We have a gun? <laughs> you forgot you had a gun? No, I know we have a gun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it was it was wild, especially because Mike and I had to just sit there and watch it all unfold. I th- built the encounter for all four of you. I yep. didn't build the encounter for two of you. Oh, we know. We could tell. If not for a bad roll uh, from Kindral on that manipulation, he was going to shoot both of them. Um, so I'll mention they do ask the mechanics on the gun. I do look, I did take a lot from the DMG. I've tweaked a few things because of uh, guns being so new in the world. But basically, one, you need to have uh, an appropriate amount of intelligence to actually be able to use it because it is a new uh, invention. The one Kindral was using specifically was a revolver that dealt 2d8 plus dex and damage. And he could shoot it Three times. Whoa. Yep. That's mean. Bethany, as Belinda, used her mystic ability to say, we are your allies. He is a traitor to the organization. In response, he got up and just kept shooting at Sadan. They just made sure Sadan was dead. Yeah. As someone who's playing a character that would have firearm proficiency if ever exposed to such things, I am certainly uh, excited. I will say in terms of, like, small guns, that is one of the most powerful ones. But there are other guns in development. <sighs> there are uh, many different types of guns that exist in the world right now. Um, the most common is basically, like, the equivalent of a musket. So usually it's a fire, spend an action to reload, fire. Boomstick. Important question. Are there any flamethrowers in development? Asking for a friend. No comment. It's distinctly possible. <laughs> Those entirely 
might be on the back burner in various shady organized experimentation. Now, let me ask you this, Tony. You know a potato launcher, right? Yes. Is there one that launches potions? I mean, isn't that basically what Leuven was? True. I mean, it's entirely possible. And there's also grenades that exist in the world. Oh, we know. The first grenade ever used in my world that has been recorded has been by none other than Chet Cheddington. What? <laughs> oh, yeah. Because <laughs> technically that adventure is canon and took place before the events of uh, Rumble Squad. That's true. That's right. It was like the holy hand grenade. You tossed it in with all the Nuparibo. Nuparibo bros. And like wiped out more than half their health for all of them. We totally need more Chet. <laughs> He's best dealt with in small, small quantities. Um, then the next question, I guess, is also for me specifically. Where do I find most of the enemies that uh, you guys face throughout the adventure, and are they homebrewed? Most of them are Monster Manual, Volo's Guide, and Mordenkainen. Um, I'm trying to think of, like, the special monsters I threw at you guys. The more recent ones, like the Gru, that you guys fought with uh, Pummel Patrol, like those weird little aberration creatures, those are actually in Mordenkainen's. They're a lesser form of... Uh, do you remember for the pre-session... You guys fought, like, that multi-arm thing that wiped out Auric in one hit and I still feel bad about. Oh, yeah, that awful thing. Yeah, it dealt, like, it did, like, six attacks against you and dealt, like, 27 points of damage total. Yeah, that thing was rough. So, the Gru are a lesser version of that. Uh... They're all aberrations called Star Spawn. Those things were nasty. Which one, the Gru or the, uh, the Mauler, I think it's called? Both. Yeah, the Mauler is nasty. That guy was the worst. No, he's not. Rydot. That's true. Rydot is the worst. How do you guys feel about Rydot? Because he is actually not in a 5th edition one. He's the only one I would say is homebrewed, but I took inspiration from other uh, previous editions and just tweaked what he had. He's so mean. I hate him. <laughs> D dang quad creens. Dang quad creens. I'm just curious to see how we meet him next, because, I mean, we're we're continuing to grow levels, so he has to come uh, swinging with harder and harder allies. I wonder if there'll be a point where we just, like, one-shot him. <laughs> so, what I usually do with enemies that I intend to have you guys encounter at some point, if you don't encounter them earlier and encounter them later, I tweak them up a bit, but they don't level the same way that you guys do. So for Rydot, he just comes with more knowledge of what you can do. And a lot of times tries to prepare accordingly. So go off the rails next time we see him is what you're saying. <laughs> I mean, he might come in where basically you just never see him or you almost never see him. And he just has the minions just whittle you down till he wipes you out or tries to. Tries to. Maybe he'll get his disc back at some point or we'll just use it against him. Just do the uh, the exploding disc maneuver. There we go. How did I forget we have that? Yeah, I forgot we had it too. Oh, did you really? <laughs> yeah, I've had it in my bag of holding. Yeah, but it will just pull the bag of holding inside of a bag of holding maneuver next time. Bamf him to the astral plane. And all of you. Yeah, well. Tomato, tomato. How did you build your listener base? I would say like Rachel. You definitely were a big push to to help with us with all the uh, social medias. Yeah, uh, I'd say with that one, it's because it was we were so small in the beginning. It was just basically spamming Twitter, just going, "Hey, we have a new episode. Hey, you also do podcasts. You should check out our podcast." And I still do that every so often. I'll just be flipping through Twitter and see somebody says like, "Hey, I'm looking for a new D and D podcast." I shamelessly self promote. I'm like, "Hey, I'm part of a podcast." Here's a link. You should totally check us out. And we also, we I think what helps is we try to jump on other opportunities as well, like with the Dark Matter, um, when we did the Podcast of Foes, things like that, I think also help because we're simultaneously kind of networking a little bit as well as getting our podcast into other feeds, which is a huge thing. Um, I know for a while we were doing a lot of promo swaps with other podcasts so you know we put theirs in our episodes they put ours in theirs stuff like that interviews 
when we went to the conventions, we network, we walk around, we talk to people, hand out cards. I got business cards for us. That's right. Really? Just if you have like social anxiety, it this will be the hardest part is just the actual like networking because you have to not be afraid to just walk up and be like, hey, I do this podcasting thing. It's about D&D. You want to hear all about it? I don't care. I'm going to tell you anyways. And then just keep talking. You just talk to them about D&D. Just a lot. But if they walk away, then stop talking. No, no, no. You, you keep talking and you just slip your business card into their hand. It's like, here, just check us out. Okay, bye. You like reverse pickpocket them? Yes. When you uh, see this in your wallet, like a month from now, you'll be like, oh, that's right. Oh, that's yeah, right. That Those thingy. people. That, that weirdo. Weirdos. Honestly, like, that's the big, I guess that's the biggest part for like me. And I think for us is a reminder, like, we do this for fun. We appreciate the support. There's so much that we appreciate and we can actually help and make this better and release more often because of the support we have. But really, the biggest thing starting in this that we kind of discussed ahead of time was, hey, let's make this a hobby. If this stops being fun, we don't have to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's kind of a big one is if you're not having fun doing it, then it's it's not fun. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you editing. I actually like editing. Um, I know I know Rachel does not. I know Adam does like editing. You get in the zone, man. And there are aspects of like the podcast bit that, you know, I'm like, I could just not worry about the editing so much this time. But overall, in the end, like I'm still loving playing the game, recording it, and releasing the episodes. It's also great for my memory when I don't remember what happened. I would say what's also really good. I mean, I know for fun from like my perspective, like not only just playing, but I like seeing charts that go like little peaks and and dips and stuff. I like you know Bethy and I sometimes get together and have a call talking about like the analytics of it and going like, oh, we had this many downloads, but look at this weird spike on X day. I wonder why we had that many. And we don't know the answers. Like, it's like a random Tuesday. We'll get like a weird number and we figure it's probably just some service has decided to run some kind of audit and it just grabbed everything, which of course those spikes get bigger over time because we have more content for it to grab. But we like looking at those going, ooh, look at this cool pie chart. Because we're nerds. <laughs> our our service actually does a great job of breaking everything down. Yeah. How do you keep track of everything happening in combat? Which enemies are hurt? Where the buildings are? What the terrain looks like? First, Roll20 is amazing for that. Just to have the map up and have that all out. Keep track of everything that's happening. I, I try to keep track of everything that's happening. We still forget. <laughs> the best way of looking at it is it's a team effort it's both the dm and then also the player keeping track of like the things very relevant to them because you, you can't keep track of everything that we can do and everything that like uh, uh we have open available to us at that moment i mean you're, you're busy with trying to think of other stuff it's on us to remember that yeah also what's affecting us like if we're blinded or prone or something like that People have probably noticed in some of our episodes, and most of us have done this at, at some point or another or multiple points. Uh, oh, yeah. Didn't I need to roll a con check earlier this turn? Concentration checks. We we always call ourselves out on the rules and mechanics if there's something like, oh, yeah, we're supposed to do that. Because if you're cheating, it's not fun. Yeah. Like there's there's still like some slight metagaming that could be amusing, but just outright cheating's no fun for anybody. So we, we'll frequently call ourselves out like, "Yeah, I need to do this thing or I wasn't I supposed to have a bonus or did that bonus run out last round?" type deal. Most of the time the bonuses I don't worry about in combat just because like it's a minute. That's 10 rounds of combat. But every once in a while you guys have an extended fight. Mhm. Mm but yeah, a lot of times I know some, like, I'll be, like, going up with a monster, and I'll suddenly go, like, I'm about to attack Chris, and he's like, wait, I have spiritual guardians up. Oh, shoot, his movement speed's halved. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Can I still get there? Yep. So I know a lot of times if it's, like, just happened, or if it was, like, happening in the moment, we'll tend to correct as we go. But if it's like, oh, that was, like, six turns ago, okay, from now on, we'll just remember that this is a thing. Not dwelling on it if it's if it's past is is a good is a good rule of thumb that that, that we've kind of established because we can always go back like a couple rounds but that'd be a pain. It's like okay, well, ten technically you would have taken some damage from this, which also means that I would have probably done this instead, and then that 
kind of just move on after a certain point. Too many permutations. Yeah, as far as like tracking, um, I know I try to in roll twenty. You can put little markers on your tokens, like if I get blessed or if I get something else that like it's temporary. I try to remember to put those on to remind myself so that I can then remind Tony. <laughs> but but that doesn't always happen. Little visual cues. It helps. The auras, especially, it's really useful to to have a visual. Yeah, Roll20 has uh, a feature that lets you, from a figure, show the range of their aura. So stuff like Spiritual Guardians that has a 15-foot radius, you can pop in on, like, Auric, and everybody can see where that radius is. So as you're moving monsters closer, it's like, okay, cool, I know I'm in range of this. Um, And I also do it for certain monsters once the party is aware of the range of the aura. I then will show them so they can see it and then they now can adapt accordingly but at first i let them just deal with it because you don't know the range at first unless you faced a similar creature no serviceable plots i haven't actually dealt with well partially because serviceable plots uh avoids more combat and i built that one to have less combat because we like to rumble you can't rumble playing chess that does a great transition speaking of chess cataclysm uh someone did ask how does the game of Cataclysm work? Is it something we made up um, or modification of an existing game? And can we share the rules? There isn't a full rule set. I'll say that first and foremost. Uh, we have a generalized thing that we made up and we do a lot of uh, intelligence rolls or sleight of hand checks if you're cheating because it's assumed once you get past a certain point, you are cheating. Cheating in quotes. But the idea of Cataclysm is you have a bag of tiles except for your king piece that is already placed out on the field, and you are placing other tiles, which are your other forces, to help defend your king and to take out your enemy's king. So very similar to just in that sense. But this was an inspiration from Mike uh, for the game The Duke, which I haven't played, but we uh, were planning at some point to tweak and work this in. I know as characters, both uh, Adam as Akiva is learning the game, <laughs> and Leuven is mostly knows how to play, though is not considered proficient yet, right? Yeah, I like. I'm, I'm kind of going with. I know the beginner gambits, uh, but I'm I'm still struggling with uh, some of the more advanced moves. So I have a question for you guys. Uh, for those of you that have listened to the episode, what do you think of Cataclysm? I think it's neat. Like uh, being being one of the people that's like quote unquote played it. I think it's pretty interesting that you guys went in depth enough to be able to have like not a full set of rules, but enough to where it it almost seems like a full game that could just be played. But I, I also like the idea that you know it's it's like a standard game, but then all the higher skilled players are constantly cheating. <laughs> Slide of hand checks because you reach into the bag and you just happen to pull out the tile you need. Is the idea. It's not just the idea of strategy, which does still play a part of it. There still needs the intelligence checks, but the sleight of hand checks, the idea is that you kind of know the bag well enough and know where your tiles are well enough that you can pull up the piece that you need and might need to like you slip a quick peek into the bag as you're doing this. So there's the sleight of hand check that's involved in the mechanics. So could you, in theory, play it with a bag of holding where you just think of the exact tile you need? There are regulated games, but yes, you could. Um, though most players who know what they're doing would not allow you to do that. So would tool expertise apply once I got proficiency? Uh, it is a gaming set. So I, I'd have to double check that, actually. I'm not sure because I know tool expertise. I don't believe it will, um, but I'd have to double check that. I don't know if that counts as a tool. Yeah, I don't think it does. I don't think it is either. I know it would be great to add that double proficiency into... Playing Cataclysm. Especially since Luvin is not going to be a sleight of hander. No, he's the int base. Like, he's he wants to play to win. You still have some decks. Legitimately. Oh, no, he just wouldn't think to cheat. Gotcha. At least not currently. Just like Akiva. I don't cheat. I just get advice. Oh, yeah. Legitimately, every time Akiva's pseudo dragon Lazarus has played against Mike as Scriv, I have rolled a nat 20. <laughs> <laughs> so now that's like Lazarus is this expert cataclysm player. Oh yeah. 
obviously. So um, rule is anytime Scriv and Akiva play, Lazarus is not allowed to give advice. He's just allowed to referee. So Lazarus versus Belinda's dad matchup, yes? Orenthal might have some problems with a pseudo dragon. <laughs> not my boy. He was already scarred once. It has only been once, hasn't it? Luckily. It's been, there's been a couple close calls. But yeah, you've only brought him back one. I need to try hard. I mean, no! um, <laughs> <laughs> it's all based off of like your reaction to seeing the danger for him. I know if you see the danger for him. So it's those dex checks like which I treat as like it's an initiative role. Do you get to react before the person who's about to attack Lazarus? Assuming you've seen them. Have you guys? OK, so, uh, Adam, I know a little bit earlier you mentioned like with Cataclysm that we have this kind of names of things and these gambits. Um, we did break down, by the way, like, is an offensive move, a defensive move, a bluff, um, and like, whether you're going hardcore, like all in, uh, is it like a slight, you know, move? Is it a testing move? Like what that all is? Um, have you noticed anything else in the Cataclysm games? I'm curious because there is more to Cataclysm that's been presented um than meets the eye are you talking about mike's whole it's a propaganda machine sure <laughs> so that's a no so cool that's good to know i mean there's already been hints that in the the episodes i think in one episode only that there is more to cataclysm than just the game but i was just curious if you like picked up on some of that stuff that's man that hasn't on. come up in a while <laughs> no because um the last one was well i mean you guys found out what the job was eventually. Go get a tuning fork. By the way, um, how's that uh, tuning fork that- It's fine. We know where it is. And we can get it whenever we want, Tony. So slight thing. Adam, as a Kiva, had a tuning fork that played a note that didn't match any like known key range. I don't know what it was supposed to be. It matched this weird little tiny loot that he had in terms of the, the, the registry. But- Akiva kind of liked the music, like the note. He thought it was pleasant. No one else did. Hmm. This doesn't seem strange at all. Eventually, they went to this lovely little town, and he dropped it off as one of the knickknacks um, that is on this guy's wall, because it's very, like, kitschy. Oh, people traveling, they give, like, baubles and all that. They find out that there's a tuning fork that they had to get that made a note that none of them liked, because it's attuned to the plane of the abyss. Look, man, do you get enough guff for the noise? Sure, I'll give it up. No, but it's not, it doesn't seem like it'd be important. How's that amber piece that you have that you maybe stole? <laughs> it's fine. That's also why I'm not giving it up. It's mine and it keeps the bugs away. By the way, these were all randomly rolled and I decided to play with them once he had them up. Like, we did a random generator thing on, like, stuff Akiva went in his shopping spree uh, back in Amaron for our for second session. And, uh, yeah, that's been a thing ever since. So it's like a piece of amber that wards away bugs. Is, is this like a uh, tiger rock where you don't see any tigers as long as you have the rock with you? No, I mean, basically, like, as long as he has this amber piece, um, they are not bothered by mosquitoes. And everybody's like, you might have stolen that from the shop owner. He was using it maybe to ward off the bugs around his then shop. Then it shouldn't have been on the ground. <laughs> it's like a citronella candle. I was thinking like one of those flea collars. But yeah, that's uh that might be a thing. Because mm -hmm. I did reiterate when they were going back to the material plane, everyone but Akiva enjoyed the notes of the tuning fork they used to help bamf them back to the material plane. Crazy stuff. Anyways, on to the other questions, because these weren't questions. I just thought it was interesting. <laughs> Is there any advice you wish you had heard when you were starting out that you can impart on a brand new baby podcast? Babies are hard to record. They don't cooperate. And, you know, they don't like to have their correct mic technique yeah. yeah and you know you, you try to uh, you try to get a specific emotion out of them in, in a scene and it's just they never want to give you the level of emotion you're looking for or they give you too much or they give you too much like it's either all or nothing you're, you're looking for a seven and they'll either give you a two or a 15 here's one have a good setup don't have a laptop that will crash during the very first recording of orenthal we don't say this from experience and using a actual phone to help record. No. Nope. Try not to record in the middle of an awful lightning storm. We don't say this from other experience, which a router was definitely not completely fried. Yeah. Yeah. 
This is also why we have backup audio recordings that are done uh, separately or offline. Two big things. One, have a backlog of like a few months of recording at least. Uh, I think some people recommend like have six months of backlog. I think we have more now, but that's just because we started recording more and have more content than we released. Like even before you think about publishing your podcast, have a backlog. Mm -hmm. Record and edit for months because it's the editing that will kill you. <laughs> on average, three three to one times on the editing. So for every like hour you have of that you produce of content, you will spend three hours working on that. At least, just so you know, from people who edit. <laughs> and then the second main one beyond that uh, of the have a backlog, have backups. We use Audacity, but we also use Zoom as a backup recording. But basically, we record locally and we record uh, online through Zoom. And having those two have been really nice because definitely Audacity has uh, crashed on us at some point or another and we've lost the files. Also, don't jump into it expecting your numbers to go from, like, like zero to 600 in, like, your first month. Go into it doing it for you. Yeah, it's going to be a slow... I mean, unless you have a really good network to pull from, which, you know, I've seen people who are, like, work on a network and then they start their own thing and they can kind of pull from that other audience. Otherwise, you know, if you're just starting out, like, don't go too hard on yourself because it's going to be slow. The, be the best mindset you could have is, I'm doing this because I find it fun, and I just kind of want to share it with people. One of our, uh, one of the emails I got had just an interesting little side note question of, for comedic characters, what do you think of the idea of a halfling paladin? We'll go a little bit in order on this. Adam, what do you think? I am not a min-maxer, so I if it seems fun, I do it. Uh, Goblin paladin was very fun, very tiny, and very sturdy. It was uh, very fun. If you want to do Halfling Paladin, I can see it being in the same vein. For comedic characters, if it seems fun, I'm all for it. That That's the whole point of the game. I don't min-max. Rachel, any thoughts? About the same. I don't min-max either. Um, I mean, any any combo can be comedic or serious. So, like, really? You do you. Have fun. Nick, thoughts? I agree, basically, with what was said before. You can turn any... any um class uh, and, and species pairing into like something serious or comedic uh, i think that a paladin with halfling luck has plenty of story elements that can be played for laughs or otherwise chris your thoughts on a halfling paladin yeah so i'll, I'll add a little different take here because i am a notorious min maxer but occasionally i will do a comedic character but it, i usually save those for something like a one shot so if you're wanting to do like a comedic character you need to think about am i going to be able to uh, sustain this for a long haul campaign or is this just like a fun one and done type deal cuz like we keep talking about Chet Chettington. that was never planned to be like a uh, reoccurring bit I fully expected everybody to hate that character when I did it, and it just became weirdly, weirdly endearing. Yeah, and I don't know why, because everything about him is, like... Cringy. But yet, it's a bit of just like, you know what, Chet? You do you, man. Bro. But he's, a, he's almost a lot like, was it Steve or whatever from uh, Stranger Things? Like, the guy with the nice hair that... Like, everybody kind of wants to hate him, but you also kind of like him because he's not the worst. He's just obnoxious. Yes. So if you're going to play a comedic character, you have to strike that right balance of being able to either keep it up for an extended period and not have everybody uh, get sick of you. Or you do it for like a one one shot type deal. But as far as if I was going to do like a halfling paladin, I'd want to give him like a Napoleon complex, I feel. So like everybody else is just standing too tall. They need to come down to his level. So wait, all, would all of his killing blows just basically take out people's knees? Yes, exactly. Well, other than that, there's no other specific questions that we have from our audience members. Do you have any questions for me? On arc one, and I will let you know if I can't answer them, but is there anything you guys have wanted to know from arc one? What would have happened if we had instead gone to save the Lady of Spirits instead of Boulder? What would that encounter have been like? 
you would have dealt with larger forces of orcs than hobgoblins. But due to the fact that they are of a very focused mindset, they're all like going to run into melee range with you rather than try to shoot you with arrows, cast spells necessarily. Their spells are divine focused. The trickiest part would be dealing with the ancestral hearts. So we would have had to fight them. They would be perfectly willing to retreat. So it would be up to you guys if you wanted to try and take them out for good or allow them to leave, depending on how the battle was going. Allow them to leave and then shame them. Here's the thing. She doesn't care. Her is about an ultimate victory. She's a planner. She's a strategist. He is not dumb, but he is more of the enforcer of the two of them. So she's the uh, lose the battle to win the war type? Mm -hmm. He'll be upset that they retreated, but he also trusts her judgment because she got them this far. So are we ever going to find a use for that stupid chromatic disc that we stole from uh, Rydat? I mean, basically, you can eventually take it apart and study it, but you technically can't use it because it's attuned to Rydat. And we can't break the attunement like a normal item. Unless he's dead. Well, we keep trying that, and it's not working. There is a way to perma-kill him. Is it like a vampire and stake through the heart? Something weird? Oddly specific? It's a specific thing, but it's not like you need to kill them in a specific fashion. You need to destroy something. They're left pinky. On which left which hand, one? though? <laughs> I'll give us a, uh, a, a mention of something that I don't remember if I've told, said on recording yet. I know I've told some people is that you guys could have personally met the champion. For Rumble Squad? Oh, that would have been terrifying. Session one, you could have met him. Oh, session one. There's a point where you guys were going to the festivities, and I mention there's this hulking, muscle-bound, bald guy. He's just arm-wrestling people over and over again, and he's just winning, and they're calling out, Challengers! Who can take this man? That was Mavic Thule. That was the champion. Just hanging out in a Cynthias. Without any armor? I mean, not that you guys would know he's evil by any means. Like, he's literally just there playing games and showing off that he is a big hulking Goliath. Which, might I mention, the only Goliath you saw in town. Yeah, I think we did. I did the knife throwing or something instead. Does he just hang out at festivals? Is that all he does in his free time? That's literally the two times that you guys could have encountered him. You guys encountered him because of Valen at the Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Does he just go around to every festival in the world just doing, just playing? He's challenging people. He wants to be the champion. I see. Of all things. That just sounds like an inferiority complex. Oh, oh, here's one. If I had not accidentally said Vashti, uh, Innocentheus, how would the buy thing have theoretically gone in your mind? Um, slowly you would have discovered strange occurrences with people who would have gaps in their memories. Um, and then my intention was also, Evelios was slowly going to be pushing that because he felt he was constantly being watched. Because he was. Mm -hmm. ah, he's not just paranoid, delusional. I mean, there's a reason he was constantly looking over his shoulder. Because, may not at every given moment of every day, but by checked up on him regularly that's the one thing i will admit uh with you guys i did not think it would happen that early Ah, uh, see there there are several things that i'm like i've been surprised at things that was one of them challenging by i mean you guys didn't know how strong she was as characters so that's fair stupid but fair and she wasn't there personally so there's that but she's having a good, you know, good time right now. She's she's fine. She's fine. She's at 70. Um, but yes, uh, that would have sent later. There would have been uh, Vashti may have slowly, like, let you know once she started to trust you more that there is something wrong with Asenthios, not just because she doesn't, she's not like there. What's your vision for Arc 2, both from a story perspective and from a meta, like, podcast running perspective? Here is the world. Go. Have fun. That's my intention for Arc 2, for, for what we've been recording and what I intended for it. Arc 1 was always supposed to be much more like railroad E. Like, you're going to be in the area that I want you to be in, and then you would do the things within that area up until its completion. And then Arc 2, guys, look, there's the rest of the world. 
I will bring you back into where you need to be once we get to, you know, the big bad of Arc 2 is acting up. But up until then, here's the rest of the world. We've entered the open world section of the game. Yeah. I say, I think you've mentioned it before, but you're planning three total arcs, or? That's what I'm looking at. Yeah, three total arcs. So arc, from the metagame perspective, arc one has kind of ended where you guys are, like, within, like, level six or seven uh, between the two groups. Arc two will end around levels 13, 14. Arc three will end at level 20. So, uh, yeah, arc two will, will be interesting. I'm curious to see where that goes. I know you guys have already gotten to experience a bit more of the world, but... I'm excited to hear the listeners take on it as well. Uh, but yeah, do, do, do you want to talk about like stylistic stuff about the editing or is that for a later time? Um, like what were you thinking? Like audio drama versus moving away from that, etc. I was realizing this year, like I can't keep up the level of editing that I've been doing, uh, which was slowly a push towards audio drama. But as cool as it would be to do an audio drama, it is a lot more work than to focus more on an actual play. So while I do want to make it cleaner, uh, more like focused so you don't have big gaps of just like nothing really happening, but also it, uh, while making that cleaner and more focused, it's a lot easier to do that and then add some music and maybe a couple sound effects than it is to take away all the game aspect. And one thing I did, especially listening to Orenthal again, and I know Adam, you have too, listening back to it, the one thing I really liked was it felt like us at a table telling a story. And I kind of liked the out of character jokes the, the, that we did and the just laughing outside of the table, outside of something that like had maybe something to do with the game, maybe not to have that continued perspective of, yes, we are still people playing a game. What? I'm not a person. No, no, no. I am a trope. And depending on podcast life balance, I imagine it, it, it just kind of depends the amount of music and uh, sound effects we decide to go with going forward. Just depends on how much time we have how much energy we have uh my intention is still like if we can do music that's great if we can't some episodes that's gonna be okay and we will do what we can but i want to release the episodes and there may be some weeks we might have a rough week um it's been a year already oh yeah we'll announce it we'll do that if there's ever going to be like a week where we can't release um i'd like to not be the case but i also need to be okay that it might be the case mm-hmm so we will, of course, let everybody know, and we'll be releasing as we can. Our intention is still weekly, but now with the wrap up of Arc 1, we'll be releasing a few other things in the meantime, and uh, have Arc 2 start up at some point in the future. We will give a heads up before that happens, as well as several other announcements, because there will be important things happening at the start of Arc 2 for both groups, um, for several reasons, but future announcements on that coming soon. Uh, what was everyone's favorite or most surprising moment? I think my favorite uh, section or segment was Pummel Patrol. Just just everything about Pummel Patrol is like, they are perfect. They're our bestest friends. I mean, you guys can still keep in contact with them. Does the Nebersil Network go to the Underdark? No. Dang it. You do have a sending stone to them, though. You do? Yes. Yeah. Who has it? I think I'm holding it. I mean, stuff's, stuff's been happening, so that's been, that's fair. But no, I, I'm glad you like Pummel Patrol. That might have been a close to last minute thing where I'm like, you know what? We need some like craziness in this. Let's bring in the Pummel Patrol. This basically was layered right on top of the Pummel Patrol arc, but my favorite stuff was really in the second visit to Neverhelm. I mean, just, just, there's a lot there. There's, for one thing, I got my Nat, my Nat 20, you know, art piece, and that was fun. But uh, also, Neverhelm is just this really mysterious thematic place. And then when we finally got that big reveal of, oh no, something really bad happened here, uh, it was a good moment. Yeah, something really bad happened here. Yeah. It's an interesting reveal. I don't know. I thought it was an interesting reveal when we found out that Rydot did not die the first time around. Rydot reborn. I was mad. <laughs> you can't have this cape back. Finders keepers. Although I was happy to get. To kill him again with hammers. More hammers. Adam? Umbra. Summoning Umbra. Easy. <laughs> because it, there was no way it was going to work out without a nat 20. Le uh, yeah, no, that 100%. I think I did tell you, you have one shot at this. There is one roll that can let this happen. The recorded reactions were great. Uh, Tony going, oh no. Everybody's reaction to it 
was so perfect. It's all out of character, but like it was such a great moment. I'm like, I have to leave these reactions in. Mike being all, say it. That was a moment, man. That's never going to come bite me in the butt, right? Never? No? She's fine? There are several things that have been done now that the repercussions have not yet been felt. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. We'll get her back at some point. You ripped a hole in the defenses of Orenthal's planar travel. We know people in high places. It's fine. Nobody's looking for me anymore. She's fine. She's technically alive. She's just being interrogated. Don't worry about it. I think at this point is a good point to call the mailbag. This has been a fun arc one. I'm excited for the events of arc two. But on that note, we just want to say again, thank you all for listening. We will post uh, contact information uh, as well as all of the various all the various locations for all the news that we had in our description, links to everything that we've talked about. And uh, thank you again for listening. And we will see you next time in the world of Ostia. Woo! Thank Bye. you. See ya.